school, there's about 320 students that go here. This is the elementary building. Out here we have the soccer field. The middle school and high school is in the building over here.
Okay, I'm here to give your name. I'm Paul. No mention Paul. Um, uh, like to say hello from Northwestern Indiana, USA.
Hey, Paul, you're on. <laughs> Paul, you're on. Talk about, talk about what we're doing. <laughs> Somebody explain what we're doing here. Go home. Ask Jared. He's working on Hey, Jared, what are we doing? We're building a fort. <laughs> you don't sound too enthused. It's not very fun. How long have we been out here today? Too long. 
since this morning, since about 9.30 this morning. So oh. like 8.45. <laughs> heavy loads of rock. There's Paul with his big muscles. Oh. Come on, Paul. Get that thing off me. Amy? Yes? No, this is Kathy's camera. Still got with you, boo. Gosh. Everybody's pitching in. Brownie, come. Brownie. 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 Ooh, nice shot. These are guys doing um, sifting for cement. They've been doing this all day. <coughs> Very hard workers. Come back, Okay, I'm done. Swedberg, who was a missionary from New Guinea, and it was during that time that we um, spent days learning how to make eggs. After I made my first egg, I was hooked on making Ukrainian eggs. Ukrainian egg art uh, consists of using instruments like this, which is called a kiska, in which you place it into the fire to get the wax hot, and then you apply the wax to an egg. Most of the time, uh, uh, the lines are drawn onto the egg and are used for a guide, and then you take the wax and go up and down on the line. Once the, the line is on there, this egg, whatever is waxed, will be white, and then it will be placed into Easter egg dyes, and then whatever color you put it in, that will be the color that you'll wax next. So if I go into the yellow dye, this egg will be yellow, or if I mark it yellow. So the process is similar to that of batik, and this is one that's finished here. I'll show you an idea of what Ukrainian eggs look like. This isn't a traditional Ukrainian egg design. This is more of a geometrical shape one. However, this one is more of the Ukrainian style. A lot of it's geometrically shaped too, and symmetrical. On this egg, I've already waxed whatever is black here is white, actually. The white has been covered, and it was dipped into the green. Now I'm going to wax whatever I want to be green by using the Kiska and covering that. And I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to say that this process goes from the lightest color to the darkest color, and then the wax is removed, which I can show you how that is being done. You'll, this egg is ready to have the wax removed. And so we place it into the flame to the side. And as the wax is heated in the flame, it melts. And then it is wiped off onto a napkin. And so you can see here the colors that were applied with the wax start to become revealed. And follow you have a Ukrainian egg, or Pasanki as they call them. Ukraine. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, show them yours, Amy. <laughs> 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 we are putting on a porch in front of the building uh, to give people a nice place to sit and visit and walk into the building on. And we're going to be using this building 
Uh, it gets used for conventions three times a year, and also it will be used. We want to start. We're going to put uh, solar lighting in so that we can use it for uh, students to study at night, high school students especially, if they have any light in their homes or if they have candle lights to do study. And also, we'll start showing films once a month. That's what we're doing. We're making a cobblestone inside of the porch.
it's not who the spirits are starting to come out. If you went in the war, it's just a celebration. They have like one hour to go. They have like one hour to go. They have like one hour to go. Did you see the Buddhist stuff yet? They got the girl off. What? No, I'll show you that. I know more modern stuff than I do. And these things where they put the fruit form in the Calabas food. Hello, we just got done shopping, and now we're going to the zoo. I don't want to go home. This is too much fun. I'm afraid to kiss it. I see Amy did. Remember, you kissed her once. Abby, do it. I gotta take a picture of it. Amy, Amy, <laughs> did it taste a lot like cheer? Yeah, it's naked, but yeah. Dad. Dad. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are never gonna let us live that one down, are you? Uh, whoa, you can't eat that, bud. Oh, here, I'll give you this Haitian food. Just turn this up on the I want Leonard. I hate it when I lose a finger to a crocodile. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
but I figured I might as well take this, you know what? Yeah. The last of my take. I forget to bring some backyard stitches. Bonnie, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Such a great trip.
city last time, which um, was very different. Uh, this was really rural. Uh, last time, just to let you know, we stayed within eight foot walls, um, and you couldn't go out at night. You couldn't, I mean, you couldn't do anything. You know, it's like they locked you in. Um, that's how I decided I was never going there unless I stayed with somebody that knew what they were doing. Um, and uh, Phil and Lonnie were those people. This time we're in a rural setting. I think we could have gone out at night. We didn't, but stay in a little complex there. We didn't have to worry about it. Um, no, no electricity for the uh, 12 volts. So if you, if you like the, the camper scene, uh, that was very different. Um, no running water. Uh, you had to, everything was from cisterns. You had to run out the water. Well, somebody did. <laughs> Jared ran down the mountain, but uh, most of us walked um, down the mountain. Uh, tell us, I'm sure you talk more about the trip, but tell us a little about how Phil and Bob here with I'm going to something. Okay. Um, I'm going to, I think we'll stay up here. Why don't I just have all the people that went come on up and we'll kind of stand around up here. Um, Phil and Lonnie are doing excellent. Uh, I asked Phil, man, isn't it a different uh, breath of air uh, being up here on the mountain? And he said, yes. It's, it's just wonderful to be out of the hustle and bustle of the city. Um, if you've ever been in a foreign uh, country, you know how they honk the horns all the time as they're driving. We were never almost without honking horns. Um, down there in the city. I mean, it was always beep, 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 beep outside. And um, in this place, you know, I think there were what? We had three potential cars, and there was there was a Jeep down the road, but there were no cars. You know, this was it. Um, they say a road. Um, it had potholes the size of Nebraska. So, I mean, you, you would call it a road, but it was unbelievable. You couldn't drive a regular car down that how that. It would just bottom out. Um, so uh, Phil and Lonnie are doing an excellent health wise. I don't know if you knew Phil had, has had malaria several times. Uh, Phil, I asked him, how's your health? He said, I'm doing the best I've done in years. Um, Lonnie stayed up at 2 and 3 in the morning every night talking to these girls, and I'll let them tell you about that. So I guess she's going to stay on to do that. Um, she was great. Um, let me just start by saying this, and I'm going to kind of turn it over to them. For every um, egg you bought, every auction service you bought, or tool you donated, or crayons you did, thank you from all of us. Because really, this was your trip. You paid over half the way uh, for us to go there, all you and your um, monies. All the materials, the concrete tools, the paint brushes, and everything that we took, um, where we left there, along with our deodorant and all the other stuff that we took too. Uh, the kids at the orphanage asked for that, so we left it. Um, but um, it was just a great experience, and really, you were the ones that uh, allowed that to happen. What I thought I'd do is um, I'll let the adults kind of come last. Okay, to brush his teeth with. 
Um, and, and you paid for that a little bit. Um, well, you maybe took care of it. <laughs> uh, Lauren, come on up.
And then we uh, made a nice little portion of the front with rocks and cement. And um, we started to make both sides up and side. And it was really tough because we, I don't know, it was like I heard a couple people say that they were uh, kind of waiting for the cement truck to pull up. But <laughs> I don't know, just because we had to do everything by hand and, and use basically like everything. Um, I don't know, it was just, it was kind of crazy how long it took you know, that many people to just make something that we made a couple hours. Um, so. Okay, anything else?
was a good experience. Did you get your hand caught in a light socket? Or? No. Uh, Craig had the orphanage kids do this to his hair. Yeah. Oh, chill. Okay. That's Lonnie's oldest film. Go ahead. Um, I think this experience changed my life and helped me understand that we take everything for granted and they don't have much down there. And we should um, understand that um, we should understand how to use things so wasteful and um, to have more fun with what you have than what you really want. And Why don't you tell them a little bit about our Easter party? Um, we had an Easter egg on it and I guess the kids really like that. Can we let the old kids go with the young ones? What did we do after? Yeah, after a little bit. Okay. And they just bowl each other over. <laughs> I didn't know these things. So we might talk a little more about that. Thanks. Let's see. We can come back if somebody has, but we got to kind of move here. Um, there's so many things that I'd like to say about this trip, but um, the most memorable thing that happened to me on the trip that didn't happen that nobody else got to witness this. Um, the last day that we were there, I woke up and we were cleaning the house because we only kind of looked a little messy. <laughs> and uh, Phil came in and said that there was a lady down the road that was in labor. And um, we, I knew this book that Lonnie had that was a maternity book or it was you know, talking about birthing. And um, I grabbed our Kathy, you know, told me to grab it. And I went with Phil down the hill in front of this little uh, cemetery on the dirt road. And when we got there, there was a little baby laying on the road. This lady was sitting out, she was squatting sitting on luggage, like a bag that she had, and they were trying to get up to the clinic so that she could have her baby. And um, the placenta was laying on the road. It was, I've never seen one before, so I was kind of shocked. But And um, Phil needed to cut the umbilical cord. And he was very, it was his first time, he was very nervous. And I looked it up in the book and found um, what it said about it, and I instructed him how to do it. The two fingers from the belly button and tie it off. And he was really nervous because if he would have done it wrong, you know, the baby could have bled to death. But he did it, and um, he cut the cord, and we both kind of just, um, you know, a breath of relief, and took the lady. The lady had ripped pretty bad, and we took her to the, um, took the baby to the clinic, and then uh, took her to the hospital in Port Prince. But I mean, it, it, here it is, the year 1999. I'm staring at a little baby on a dirt road. You know, she couldn't even, you know, make it to the hospital. It was really eye-opening. Amy? Um, Amy and Amy, especially Amy and Becky, uh, spent a lot of time down in the orphanage. Um, and Phil and Lonnie lived upstairs, and the kids lived underneath them. If you remember the old orphanage, you might not remember that. Same situation. Um, they live upstairs in a two-story house, and the kids live downstairs. Um, why don't you tell about the orphanage, something about it, what you guys did, um, or what we did in the orphanage, the work we did there, because Josh only talked about the community building. So. Living room area, yeah, common area. How about now, the guys and girls all in one room? All the guys in the other mm -hmm. And where do they eat there? Tell them about that. And where do they have their kitchen? Like the dining room area, a little area up front. Uh, their kitchen was like, because like, they go out of the house and the door and it's in Underneath the steps, yeah. So, um, let's see, why don't you talk about the people that are from each name some of the kids or some of them that you knew? You don't want to talk about that? Uh, Amy, you know, I got us all crying when we left. <laughs> Maybe she wasn't the only one. But, uh, is that all you want to say? Okay. Tyler, I know what you're going to talk about. I really 
enjoyed Haiti except for Port-au-Prince. It's a very rundown town. The, my first experience was when we went to the airport. I was taking pictures and I took a picture of one of the customs officials and she came over to me and told me that I was not supposed to do that. And Paul told me the reason was that I could get the picture developed and show it to people and tell them to bribe her to bring drugs into the country. So I probably made a few people mad. Um, as soon as we got out of the airport, there were a bunch of taxi drivers that were swarming over us wanting to get rides. And we had to tell them, no, we already had rides. But, and we had, when we were driving along the Port of Prince, when we slowed down, we had to watch our luggage because people could run up and take it. They, did, they had more uh, modern type stuff down when we were down there. They had a, a gas station that if you just went in there, you'd think it was from America. And Lonnie told us when we were in there, she said, uh, don't anybody take anything because if the cops see you, they'll just shoot you. And that's pretty harsh. That's just the way they deal with stuff down there. Just no tolerance. Um, Tyler, why don't you just tell a little bit about um, the voodoo that you were so interested in. Um, we got to go, when we were driving to uh, Montana, which is a hotel we stayed uh, ate at, we went past a bunch of what are called rah-rahs, which are voodoo ceremonies. If you look at the people, you would think they were drunk, but they can't afford to. And I broke one of the rules and took a picture of one of them. Uh, luckily, all of us made it back with no wounds. Or... <laughs> but it, it's just the religion of the voodoo stuff, it's kind of freaky about some of stuff. So. Okay. Gene, why don't you come? Well, I had a really good time. I wanted to go to Haiti for a long time. Um, I got accused of not doing a lot of work, which is true, I did. And uh, we really had a special time with Lauren. A lot of the missionaries are pulling out of here. So she, she felt like it was a good timing for us to come there and share with her and be with her. It was a wonderful experience and, and friendships were bonded closer together. I thank all of you for giving me the opportunity to go and have a special time with Mom. Thank you. Uh, Kathy, are you not coming up the top? <laughs> uh, let me say uh, that uh, what Jean uh, said is we felt. Some of our ministry there, while we think we're going to help the orphanage doing all this work, uh, Phil kind of set us down at the beginning and said, your trip here isn't so much about what work you do. For one, the price of one of us to go down, they can hire a Haitian worker for many um, weeks. But um, it was about education for us. And, and we sat around at night in devotions talking about our experiences um, and uh, trying to apply that to our Christianity. Um, Phil said that or maybe our main goal was to build relationships. And as uh, Jean said, um, part of those relationships are with the, the Murphy children and with Phil and Lonnie. Um, I told you before, the girls stayed up wee hours in the morning every night. Um, they, uh, they did Ukrainian eggs. They talked about everything. Phil and I, we enjoy arguing about theology and things like that, and so we spend our time doing that. Um, but um, as far as uh, cultural shock, um, we were able, to, in, a, in the safe confines of the Phil and Lonnie, able to get a, a different view of the world. Um, the church service we were at last Sunday morning, the sincerity was so obvious. Um, we didn't have to know what words they were singing. We felt their spirit. And that's some of the things we talked about that night at Devotions. Um, once you go to a place like this, and I know many of you have been uh, out of the country or on mission trips, you can never really be the same. Um, it opens your eyes in such a way that you can't, even when you close them, you um, and you can still see those sides. Um, 
Let me just kind of end with this thought, uh, and then I want to kind of show you the stuff they have. Uh, they brought some of the, the things they bought there. Um, it was on a trip like this that Orlin took, that Lonnie uh, received her call to the mission field. And she, I asked her to talk about that. And she did. And she talks about how she was in high school after that trip. And she was in study hall. You probably heard this story one time. And she heard a child cry. And she, she said, I heard the children of Haiti cry. And she ended up there. So before us, um, I don't know what missionaries, future missionaries stand, but I want to say thank you to you for the opportunity. Um, it was my privilege to travel with this crew. They were great. Uh, they were troopers. They worked super hard. And uh, I just want to say thank you again. Why don't everybody kind of pull out some of your things? And um, I tell you what, let's do. Uh, Tyler can do a swing for us with his machete. <laughs> Have to be careful with that. We only lost one person with that. That's um, right. And then um, just kind of tell you what, once you walk down the aisles and show them the stuff so they can see that close and then know when you can come and try to end this. I think we took our time. More than I did. I don't know if you can speak for all of them, but uh, you had time to get you talk about all this stuff. What, what do you believe God was saying to many of the persons? Well, um, the last night on devotions, the fact is, um, I didn't talk during devotions. They talked. And uh, they talked about our extreme abundance and how we take it for granted. Um, you can never look at a toilet the same way until you... You can never look at a sink um, the same way, uh, dishes the same way, food the same way. So, kind of on a surface level, our extreme... I mean, even the Porsche one, I don't know which one's the Porsche, but would the Porsche person please raise their hand? <laughs> anyway, uh, no way about this. Uh, the Porsche one of us is filthy rich, compared. And then to look at the sincerity, our sincerity in worship and their sincerity. The kids there, you can tell the kids in the orphanage, especially some of them, uh, love the Lord. And, uh, and we could just see in their face. And they were kind of like, uh, examples to us in a different culture. And then lastly, to kind of take that, um, we took somebody who not only talks about their faith, um, me, I talk about to someone who lived out their faith, Bill and Ron, who uh, are there share their living love to those Haitians. They, um, they, the UN's going to pull out in this month, and they've got to make a decision again. Are they going to stay? And like um, Gene said, most everybody they know is pulled out. So uh, we realize the loneliness of uh, the missionary. Let me tell you something interesting, though. We were asking about um, what if there was another coup? Uh, Tyler says the coup of the week or the government of the week down there. Because you never know who's gonna, what's going to happen this week, you know. Um, Phil Monty said, well, if there ever anything went wrong, they think that their whole neighborhood would surround their orphanage and protect them. That's how much a difference they're making in that little uh, community. And to me, that says they're sharing not just the gospel, uh, you know, because it's evangelized, maybe it's evangelized, but living out there. So that's kind of what we talked about. But one of the things that we uh, just kind of take for granted is that missionaries go and life is okay, it's wonderful and good for them, and there is no danger, live in a wonderful world. But the truth of the matter is that uh, missionaries in many places are in danger, even in the best of countries now. There is an anti-American feeling in many countries of the world today. And if you're an American walking down the street, you are subject to uh, being harmed, captured, if you have a nice vehicle, and anything is nice in those countries, uh, you are uh, the strong possibility that your car will be hijacked and you can be harmed in the process. So when I served as a missionary board president, I was always concerned about the welfare of missionaries and their families. 
when you bring people out, when you allow them to stay in, how much decision do you allow them to have because most of them would stay? Sometimes you've got to make an administrative decision that no, we can't let you stay anymore. And yet, at the same time, you don't want to do that very often because that's the very reason you're there to minister in those difficult times. So you can hold them up in prayer. One of the difficult things I think some people have, and I caught it in a couple of them tonight, is the reverse effect that it has on you when you come back into a culture of plenty, when you've been in a culture of poverty. Everything you have, you begin to dislike because you recognize I'm so rich and they're so poor. And it's a difficult adjustment to make. So uh, you might remember these young people in that process of adjustment. Thanks. <coughs> Thank you.